1860, and a new ship prepares to rule the seas. Britain's control of the oceans is under threat from a new ironclad fleet of French warships. The Royal Navy has built HMS Warrior in response. The fate of the British Empire, it seems, is at stake. HMS Warrior was fast, powerful, and armed with the latest naval weapons. Charles Dickens described her as a black, vicious, ugly customer as ever I saw, whale-like in size, and with as terrible a row of incisor teeth as ever closed on a French frigate. We're here on the gun deck, which doesn't seem that dissimilar to Nelson's flagship, the Victory, built a century before. The difference is, of course, the size, the scale. The central part of the gun deck here is 216 feet long. HMS Victory, the whole ship would sit in here with 40 feet to spare. And the guns especially. What's different about the guns? That's about twice the size of the heaviest cannon that Nelson has available to him, but it's got five times the destructive power. And that can fire one round every 55 seconds. As well as her awesome firepower, below decks, the warrior was built to protect her crew to the max. The ship's sides are four and a half inches of wrought iron armor plate. At the back of that is a foot and a half of teak. The armor plate stops the projectile. The teak is there to distribute the shock waves and stop the bolts that hold everything together from breaking and the armor plate falling off the ship's side. This extraordinarily powerful warship, what action did she see? She never fires a shot in anger. <laughs> really? So in that sense, she did her job. She's incredibly successful. HMS Warrior was the ultimate deterrent. During her 10 glorious years of service, she had every country running scared, making the seas safe for British trade and passenger travel. It wasn't only warships that were changing, and changing fast. Steam engines had opened up the globe to Victorians. Journeys that had taken months, years, were now completed in weeks. Passenger liners had arrived, and behind them, one of Britain's greatest engineers. Isambard Kingdom Brunel was a man on a mission to link London to New York. His Great Western Railway was already whisking passengers from Paddington to Bristol. The transatlantic crossing was the missing link. Brunel's first attempt at a passenger liner was a paddle steamer, SS Great Western. But it was a competitive market, and the Great Western's paddles slowed her down. Brunel had a better idea. Brunel went back to the drawing board and totally redesigned his passenger liner. Five years later, it was ready. And this is the result the SS Great Britain. She's in Bristol now, where she's been painstakingly restored. At her launch in 1843, the Great Britain was described as the greatest experiment since creation. She was made of the Victorian material of choice, iron, and powered by the latest in propeller-driven steam technology. More people were traveling to New York than ever before. Many of them rich with business interests in America. To appeal to these wealthy customers, Brunel and his backers were gambling on their new ship being the ultimate in comfort, style, and size. Its original name was the Mammoth. Uh, that gives you an idea of the scale. Nothing like this had ever been built before. Queen Victoria visited the ship to give it a royal seal of approval. It was a sensation. Nobody had seen anything quite like it. The SS Great Britain enabled people to travel um, much quicker and much safer than they'd ever done before. In the 1850s, a new passenger route had opened up. Australia was in the grip of gold rush fever. 
Hundreds of thousands of people were prepared to brave three months at sea for a new life in the Australian gold fields. The iron-hulled Taylor was designed to carry upwards of 600 people on the long voyage from Liverpool to Melbourne. But the ship had only just left Liverpool when the crew spotted something strange. Compasses on board wouldn't match up, but they thought it wasn't too big a degree of difference. They'd sort it out as they, as they got on. As the Taylor reached the Irish Sea, she was hit by an epic storm. The crew, battling with the sails, discovered the ropes hadn't been seasoned properly, making them unmanageable. And that wasn't all. Originally, she was meant to have two engines as well as sails. However, they rushed making her, so they didn't actually put them in. So the engines weren't there at all? No. They're in a storm. They can't work the sails. What more could go wrong? They couldn't really steer the ship. Why? The rudder had been cut down to allow the ship to actually go from Warrington, where she was built, down the Mersey to Liverpool, where she was fitted out. And what this meant was they couldn't direct her in any way, shape or form. It's estimated that day around 400 people died. There were five inquiries into the disaster, which found fault with the shipping company White Star for not checking the compasses or carrying out sea trials. Although no one went to jail, White Star eventually went bankrupt. But its name was taken by another shipping company, which went on to launch the most famously ill-fated ship of all, the Titanic. But beyond our coastal waters, a very different kind of ship was busy securing Britain as a power player in global trade. There were fortunes up for grabs on the hugely profitable trade routes, if the ships were fast enough. The urge for speed to have the fastest trading vessel to cross the world's oceans led to perhaps the most famous ship of the Victorian era, the Cutty Sark. With her streamlined hull and masts that held 32,000 square feet of sail, the Cutty Sark was one of a new breed of super ships called clippers because they moved at such a clip. She was the very fastest ship of her time and was built in Dumbarton for the Victorian shipping magnate Jock Willis. But this brilliantly designed ship had a rival, the Thermopylae. Thermopylae was built the year before Cutty Sark and the owner was professing that this was going to be the fastest ship afloat. So it was all about pride and prestige and, of course, crucially, about money. In 1872, the Cutty Sark set out to beat Thermopylae on the tea run from Shanghai to London. As they sailed across the Indian Ocean, Cutty Sark surged ahead. By the time she'd reached the tip of Africa, she was 460 miles in the lead and heading for victory. Then, disaster. Off the Cape of Good Hope, she was hit by a massive storm which tore her rudder clean off. Quickly, a makeshift forge was assembled on deck. And together, the stowaways and ship's carpenter used spars from the rigging to make a temporary rudder. It's an amazing feat of engineering. It's an incredibly difficult thing to do at the best of times, let alone in the middle of a storm. The Cutty Sark was back in the race, but it was too late. Nine days after Thermopylae, she arrived in London to a hero's welcome. The British Board of Trade hailed the work of the crew as a model for making a replacement rudder at sea. So the race was lost, but the reputation very much was not. All of the attention was on Cutty Sark and this amazing feat of engineering. So Cutty Sark didn't win, but did become famous? Absolutely, yes. 